Everybody set. Three, two, one. Action. Episode eight. Gosh. The first film didn't even have a number. Ryan has written a story that's unexpected but right. Some of the stuff that happens, people are going to be like, oh, my God. Even though I think I know it all, they throw things at me story-wise I never could have imagined. And even though everybody knows that it's the second in a trilogy, it feels like its own thing. Star Wars is so cool because there's all these creatures and all these amazing visual effects. But all the characters are also so complex. Ryan needs to work on his Wookiee sounds. <laughs> ridiculous. New director, I can't even just learn a Wookiee sound. <laughs> it feels like the storylines are becoming more established. We're really getting to know these new characters also with the characters that we know and love. We're seeing their lives change. Everything is being shifted in an opposite way to what the audience expected after seven. Ryan's made Star Wars fresh and new. I'm hoping it'll be a little shocking, but I'm hoping it'll feel real and honest. It's our most ancient story of good against evil, told in the most fascinating way, but it has a real spiritual depth to it. It's about family, and that's what's so powerful about it. Tell us what the uh, most difficult part of getting back into Kylo Ren would be. What element of his personality is the toughest to tap into? The costume, I would probably say. And where do we find Kylo Ren when the film opens? We find him right after where he left him off of Force Awakens. There's, not, there's, no, there's no kind of time gap. I don't think there's been a lot of time to process anything uh, yet. Uh, is, um, what is it like having to work with the mask? You get to, you work with the mask and you don't work with the mask. Is it challenging? I, I mean, yeah, it's challenging. That, like, sometimes you can't see, but uh, it's really, I think it's like, it's a beautiful mask. I really, I like it both wearing it and not wearing it. You know, you know I don't know what, it's hard to, it's hard to say. Uh, the theme of it, of people who are hiding, you know, um, behind masks, I remember for the original one wasn't like it was part of the Star Wars world that we didn't want to take for granted that you know people just wear masks for no reason. So we tried to, um, at least even for myself, no try to figure out why he was hiding or why he why he needed it. And what's the relationship between you and General Hux in this film, Kylo? Well, kind of similar to where uh, they are in the Force Awakens, where it seems more. Maybe it's, you know, uh, competitive, you know. Um, I'd say that's the best way to answer that. And uh, the physical preparation for this film, mm -hmm. more intense, same? Kind of similar in some ways and different in others. It's like the, um, the first one, I feel like the vocabulary of uh, the a fighting style that we were kind of going with was we were coming at totally fresh. We're 
because we started this kind of almost a month after we finished The Force Awakens, there, the, that kind of vocabulary was still in our bodies more, so we made things easier and a little bit, of, little bit faster. But the, the rigor of doing it was maybe more intense for this one. So uh, Mark Hamill was in Force Awakens a little bit in this film, a big part of the story. Yeah. How was that working with, a, you know, with Mark? It's hard to say without saying that I, we, if I actually did, but um, I will say that as far as like uh, being around him, he is a very, uh, you know, charismatic, generous person who is not closed off at all. It could very easily be, I've kind of done this before and, and I, I know how it goes, so I'm just gonna kind of, but he, you know, as you kind of hope people like, uh, him are in that position couldn't be more generous, couldn't be more um, uh, available to kind of talk about it. It's he's like he's an amazing guy, I think. And so, uh, Force Awakens, uh, you were part of the new newbies, the new cast. Uh, now we have new, newer cast yeah. members. How was uh, how was the balance between the legacy cast and the your cast from last film and then the new cast? Great. There's no hierarchy on set, and that comes from leadership down, which starts with Ryan and all and Kathy. And there's no, uh, there's no like we uh, we we've been this before. We know what we're doing because none nobody does. No, even the, I, I even if you ask Mark probably about it, I'm sure he would say the same answer that he, he's done. Um, four of them now before, but I, th I think he probably still approaches it with not knowing what's going to happen. And I think everyone realizes that and, and doesn't want to do themselves or anyone else a disservice by telling them what their experience is going to be, N nor did the original cast do that to us because it's, it's very personal to every person. Everyone responds to a different the movie of this scale, you know. Um, so you, uh, it's, it's very generous atmosphere. And Mark did say the same thing, pretty much, because I've already asked him that question. Did he? Yeah, yeah, he was very, like, uh, I, I get to my pages just like everybody else gets my pages. So, right, right. So you're dead on there. Uh, the practical sets for this were su uh, supposedly real impressive and massive and yeah. more detailed than we've ever seen in any other Star Wars film. Uh, can you tell us what it was like working with that and if you had a favorite set? Um, no, I didn't have a favorite set. But I, I will say that this time I had more time to enjoy the sets. Well, I think with the first one, it was more terror or, or denying that, you know, oh, there, look, there's a Millennium Falcon. You're like, oh, okay, put it out of your mind and just focus on the story. Uh, but this one, because I had a better sense of what the world was, I think I had more time on set to sit back and enjoy how the, the scale of them. And the audience, when they, uh, this is my final question, when the uh, audience sees the film and is experiencing it, what do you think they're gonna walk out from take what do they take away? Again, I think that's a very personal uh, thing. I, it, what is great about this movie is that it's able to balance so many different stories that are not still just plot devices or you know two dimensional. Everyone is a three dimensional person, I think, um, and it doesn't sacrifice. That Ryan just knows what I uh, what you kind of hope directors know who are working on uh, this movies this size that no one will care about any kind of you know explosion or ship or animal if there's no humanity behind it and if anything I think it uh, obviously it lends itself to the story and the more you vested are in the people the stakes are obviously higher so hopefully people will take that away from it but it's impossible for me to say what a general kind of um, thing someone will zero in on probably for some people it's all about porgs some people it'll be all about you know luke you know it's hard it's hard for me to say what people will will pull from it but uh if anything it'll hopefully feel as real as possible uh so tell us what it was like to be back in the star wars universe play ray um it was nerve-wracking being back playing ray i think the first time around was so fun and it was <coughs> everything happened so quickly um, that I didn't really hold many uh, expectations. And then obviously, because the reaction to the first one was really wonderful, but then suddenly I was like, expectations! So it was more scary, but being surrounded by a wonderful cast and crew obviously uh, made that go away.
and then it was just great. And how has the character matured in, in what has she learned from? As of, uh, where, the, where the, the film takes off, Ray has learned nothing that the audience hasn't seen. And I think what's great is because we're picking up with her story right where we left off, she's asking questions that the audience are asking. So any sort of emotional growth she's having, the audience is having too. She's asking questions that other people are wondering. Um, and I think it's great because anything she's experiencing, the audience is seeing, they're right with her there. Uh, Ray is a heroine that is adored by young girls, women, and guys that like badass heroines. And um, what are the attributes that make her a role model to all those people that love her? I think the attributes that anyone has that make people like them tend to be that they make other people feel good, that they try and do the right thing, and that they're nice to be around. And I think in this, uh, like Ray was alone for so long and then meets BBA and immediately would do anything to help BBA and then meets Finn and immediately would do anything to help Finn um, and is open to relationships and open to adventures and so I think I think it's that it's like an openness and a willingness and a kindness that she has. Nice, nice. Uh, tell us about Ray's look in this film, how it's different. Um, Ray's look, we begin uh, in the look we left her with and then the look we go into is more warrior or as Americans say, warrior, um, which I always found hilarious, is more warrior and for me feels more, um, uh, for me it seemed more like the Kurosawa type of thing that, that Star Wars originally had so much of. Um, it, it, for me it felt really cool because it felt more like uh, a martial arty feeling, um, an Asian inspired feeling which was uh, cool, which was really cool, and it was great to move in, in the fight. And um, the, the Star Wars films, the last one and this one, have amazing practical, detailed sets. What was it like to work on the, uh, I hear, more massive? Yeah, um, uh, it was awesome to work on everything. Like my favorite, and Ryan's talked about it too, is actually being in Ireland which is a set that obviously was worked on too, but it's just a natural set, which was so beautiful um, and wonderful to be at. And because we st sort of started there, when you then get back to the set, you're already rooted in that place that you actually were. And I think so much work was done to make us feel like we were actually in a place and that it wasn't a stage. The sets are unbelievable. Seriously, they're unbelievable. And it looks so, it looks so good. So hopefully people We'll fill that too. I'm sure, I'm sure. The, um, uh, you, you've been introduced already for The Force Awakens. Uh, the, the fandom, the Star Wars fans are a unique uh, breed. Mm -hmm. um, how has that uh, changed your life or how are you embracing that? Um, I think there's an awful lot that's wrong in the world at the moment. And to be part of something that people think is right is wonderful. And as an actor too, you couldn't really ask for much more. To be in something that everyone has a different opinion, everybody has a different story about where their love came from, about where their love took them for the Star Wars world. Um, that it's overwhelming at times because I was never really like a big fan of anything. Um, but to see the love that people feel for something that I think is inclusive and wonderful and brings people together is uh, fantastic. And last question, uh, what do you want audiences to come away from this film with? I think the beauty of Star Wars is that people have take so many different things away from it. Like ultimately it's a family story, but then some people prefer the ship, some people prefer the creatures, some people prefer, it's, it's, it's a whole own thing. So I hope and I think there is um, much that will please a lot of people in The Last Jedi but also enough that people will have their own experience of it and take their own thing, be that the relationship between Luke and Ray, be that the relationship between Finn and Rose, or the Porgs, or, you know, or the island, whatever that may be. So how did it feel to bring Luke Skywalker back in this episode? We saw him quickly in Force Awakens, but now he's back. Well, the pressure was much stronger because in Seven, I had a sort of a minimalist contribution so I can enjoy all the fun 
but I didn't have to do a, any of the heavy lifting. This one, Luke, is more important to the storyline. So, um, and the, it's like the Doctor's Creed, first do no harm. That's what I was trying to accomplish at, at a minimum. Uh, you wanna do your best, you want to uh, blend in, because these are certainly ensemble pictures. You know, Luke's story is only one of many, many that you'll see. The sets were uh, uh, supposedly ma more massive than they were in any other film and detailed. How was it working on all that detailed scale? Well, I'm not giving anything away because now they've established there's a casino a set. And I'm telling you, I'd never been on a set that opulent in my life. Plus 150 extras, extras in exotic makeups and alien uh, prosthetics and audio animatronic alien pets. I mean, everywhere you looked. I mean, I've seen the finished film and it's impossible to feature everything that I saw on set that day. I made a small film called Brigsby Bear and it occurred to me, just at the price tag for that set, you could probably make 150 Brigsby Bears, but uh, they spared no expense because people the films keep getting bigger and more elaborate because there's nowhere else to go. And uh, tell us what it was like to step on the Millennium Falcon again. Well, I thought, oh boy, it's gonna be fun. Uh, I said to my sons, you wanna go? Yeah, yeah, sure, Dad. So my whole family went and the documentary crew said, oh, you're gonna go on for the first time. Can we film you? Because it wasn't the day I was shooting, I was just in street clothes. So I w went up the ramp and I wasn't expecting to be so moved by it. I mean, it was almost like visiting a house that I grew up in that I never expected to return to. And every detail was so accurate. Everything was the same. Every dent, every scratch, every uh, hanging pipe and oil drip. I mean, it was astonishing. And I started getting choked up. I didn't know why. I didn't want the documentary crew to be looking at all this, and so I said, excuse me, and I went around and sat in the cockpit with my back to everyone, and I thought, holy moly, this is uh, a memory I'll never forget. Because it's, un it's unexpected, and it encompassed so much of my collective sense memory of what it was like to be uh, back in the originals. You've lived with Luke for almost 40 years or plus. Uh, how has it changed or uh, how do you embrace that legacy? Well, part of it is that, you know, you have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and then you got to move on. You know, there's so much detail in your head that you have to sort of do a memory flush just so that you're able to memorize new lines. So I've forgotten more than I remember and then you meet these fans that know everything about the movies. They've studied them. They've analyzed them. They've read the novels. They've played the games. They get the, you know, I was asked in a trivia question, what was the model number of the Millennium Falcon? This 10-year-old boy goes, F19687X5, well, he you got it exactly right. I, <laughs> well, needless to say, he slaughtered me. But later I asked his father, how did he know that? And he says, well, Britain bought the vehicle manual guide that you know breaks down all the, your land speeder and the X-wings and the TIE fighters. But even that, that he would remember the exact model number, that's an extreme example, but you get the idea. The fans seem sort of uh, semi-disappointed in me because I'm not as knowledgeable as they are. But I didn't have to be, you know? I mean, getting back into the saddle is a different story. You know, I have to remember all these things and do my homework and, oh yeah, okay, that happened, this happened, and who's this guy again? But uh, luckily I have a lot of people to hold my hand and get me through it. Well, at least you did attempt a Wookiee voice during that competition. He didn't, <laughs> Britain didn't even go for it. But I have two last questions okay. real quick in my final minute. Um, uh, what's the memory you're gonna take away from making The Last Jedi? Probably the most prominent memory would be that island, Skellig Michael,
because it's not easy to get to the top. Those steps are brutal and they just do, they go on for days. But when you get to the top, it is so, it transports you. You know, it really does feel like you're in another world. I only had that experience once before and that was way back in uh, Tunisia when we were on the salt flats, which is 360 degrees of horizon because the salt water doesn't let any vegetation grow. It's just unearthly. So there I am in my Luke costume with the belt and uh, the floating car and R2 was there and I turned my back. The crew was filming something else and the sun was going down. Just like the sun's, it wasn't double, but, and I got the chills. I, I really felt I was in a galaxy far, far away. I certainly wasn't on Earth. And that never happened again. Norway, come on, snow is snow. When we did uh, Endor, we're in the, uh, you know, Crescent City. I've seen trees like that before. But Ak Tu, the Skellig Michael was, uh, again, I had that feeling. I, you know, I turned around, I was looking out at the sea. Again, the crew was engaged somewhere else. And I was alone, and oh, I got the goosebumps again. I thought, yep, I'm back. Uh, I didn't write these questions, so some of them I have to read verbatim. Hit me. So uh, what were your thoughts and reactions when you were first offered The Last Jedi? Uh, I was, I mean, if any Star Wars fan out there imagines what their reaction would be if they were asked to do direct the next one, that's how I felt. It was out of, it was it felt like it came out of nowhere. I didn't see it coming. It's so unexpected. And I felt like, uh, yeah, I felt like a, a planet blew up in my head. <laughs> Uh, as a writer, how did you approach uh, crafting this story, and what were the elements that were most important for you to mm. put in? Well, I know, this is the second chapter after The Force Awakens, so Force Awakens created these amazing, vibrant new characters. It was the job of this movie then to pick them up and, and really kind of test their mettle, put them through their paces. So I tried to just kind of figure out, really get inside the head of each of the characters and figure out, okay, where did they go next? And that ended up leading to some really unexpected places. And then Luke Skywalker is the other big ingredient in this movie. I knew we had to figure out what's the deal with Luke. Um, it's just, with the uh, Force Awakens yeah. introducing new cast members, you, you now in this film have three different yeah, you know, yeah. iterations of cast members from the original yeah. trilogy to the ones introduced in Force Awakens, and there's new. Tell us about the experience of yeah. working with that multiple, multi-level cast. It's interesting how there's always a uh, there's always kind of a correlation between what's happening on screen and what's happening in real life. So to be on set and to have Mark and Carrie, who obviously go all the way at the beginning with these films, and then to have you know Daisy and Adam and John and uh, Oscar and everyone who was in The Force Awakens, and then to have Kelly Marie Tran and Laura Dern and Benicio del Toro, who this is their first Star Wars outing. Um, and I was with them. I was the new kid. So um, to have that multi-layered kind of generational thing, I, I, I don't know. It felt right. And uh, I've heard that sets are more massive yeah. uh, in this production. And it obviously takes a balance between special effects and the practical, detailed, amazing sets that are, you're working with. How, how does, does that balance yeah. come about? And how do you have to work with that? Yeah, we had a, a huge amount of practical sets for this film, and part of the lived-in feel of Star Wars is something we really wanted to capture. Um, at the same time, uh, the other part of Star Wars is constantly pushing the envelope in terms of cutting in special effects. So the handoff between the practical and what ILM brings to the table visually, um, where those two meet, has always been kind of where these movies live. And the uh, final question is, what do you expect audiences will take away when they're walking out of the theater? I hope audiences come out of the theater wanting to run into their backyard, grab their Star Wars toys, and start flying spaceships around. I hope it just feels like a great Star Wars movie, a fun Star Wars movie that uh, takes you back to being 10 years old again.
need someone to show me my place in all this.